Here we are, face to face, couple of silver spoons. We see if there's a heavy metal version of that. Open to find. We're hoping to find. We're two of a kind. Two of a kind. Oh, shoot. That's not what I wanted. Thanks for listening to the Doing Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. He has special needs. Why? Why do they have special needs? Because. What's wrong with them? They have developmental disabilities. And Rish Outfield. Oh, you mean they're retarded. All right. (laughs) Welcome, everybody. It's the show you've all been waiting for. Oh, the final episode? Oh, the final episode of Plague Birds Part 2. Wait, how many parts did we split Plague Birds Part 2 into? Two. So this is Part 2 of Part 2. I think (laughs) technically it's the ever-dreaming verdict of plagues. No, I think, I'm pretty sure it was called Plague Birds Part 2, the squeakquel. Oh, that's right. We did say that last week, right? We made an editorial change. Just... (laughs) Felt like it was missing some kind of oomph. Yeah. And it tested better with the squeak wool then. The test audience really dug that versus the ever dreaming verdict of plagues title. So yeah, we just scratched that one out and and here we are, face to face. A couple of silver spoons, sing it! We're hoping to find... A two of a kind. I'm Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome to, to the Tinsty Audio, Audio Fiction, Fiction Magazine. Magazine. Welcome. <laughs> okay, now that everybody's turned the show off... And only the hardest of hardcore people are still listening. That's really all I wanted to listen to this episode. Just the Silver Spoons theme song part? No, no, no. The, the hardcore, ah. the diehard with a vengeance fans of the Doonsty. Mm. Fan the Doonsty. <laughs> I heard <it>. Mr. John <laughs> Smith. Oh, 223 okay. Crescent Circle. Okay. Thanks for hanging around. I was uh, thinking of Nigel, but... We're going way back yeah. with that one. Anyhow, this is part do. Of the Plague Bird sequel. If you haven't listened to the last episode, please do. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's written by Jason Sanford. Is there anything else we need to say? Uh, okay. So if you remember, for those of you who have already listened to the first half, and if you haven't really, go back to episode 125 and listen to that. And if you haven't listened to episode 92, which is actually the first Plague Bird story, maybe you should go back and listen to that. Then Just listen start to episode, with episode 125. Zero. Yeah, there you go. And listen to all of them. But, but uh, yeah, last week we did part one of the story. And in that part, we met our plague bird who came to a village and there was some, some weird goings on there. Something was wrong. She judged someone to be guilty of murder and discovered later that maybe she wasn't actually guilty of murder. No, no, that she definitely wasn't. The alderman had done the deed. And yeah, so now she she had to bust out the door and escape from where she was. And these people in the uh, village were chasing her. They chased her all the way down. And she jumped off the dam, fell into the water, and drowned. And that's where we left you at the end of the story. Wait, no, that's not the end of the story, though, was it? Should be. What kind of monster is Jason Sanford to kill this character that we've grown to like? <laughs> and yeah, so I don't know what we've got to show you because the main character's dead. So, uh, Maybe you- there's an author's note. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's what we've got for you today. Author's note. Part two of the story is the author's note. Well, something's coming up. I don't know what OAT is going to roll, but it's going to be something. Before we continue, a reminder, Brian Lincoln produced this episode. That's right. Excellent work. Written by Jason Sanford. Is there anything you can share about Jason Sanford that we haven't already shared? Well, let's, let's plug that short story collection. That's what I was going to do. We already shared this last weekend. I think the last time he had a story on here as well. But he's got a short story collection called Never Never Stories that uh, is out now. You can get it on ebook as well as on the newly released print edition. Where can you get that? Is it available in a Barnes and Noble? Are there still Barnes and Nobles? <laughs> Are there still books? I believe you can get it from Barnes and Noble or at Amazon, but his recommended avenue of buying the book would be directly from Spotlight Publishing. We'll have a link to them in the show notes. That They're, they're a small press, so he suggests buying it straight from them so you can better support them. I guess they get more of the proceeds that way. 
and Barnes and Noble doesn't shake them down for all the, the profit they could get. The book uh, includes several stories that you've probably even heard here on the show before, like When Thorns Are the... Oh, that wasn't on in this show. When Thorns Are the Tips of right, Trees. That's, that's the story that introduced me, that, that created the relationship between us and Jason Sanford. Yeah, that was the first story we ever did. We actually read it for Starship Sofa. And we're like, wow, this is so good. And so we sent Jason an email and said, hey... You wouldn't happen to have a story that we could do on our show, would you? And yeah, since then, we've been doing stories by Jason Sanford every six months or so. And boy, I'm sure glad we did that story that one time because it's been so worth it. But also, it's got Peacemaker, Peacemaker, Little Bo Peep. Peace! Which you've also heard on here. And, if, and several other really good stories. Pick yourself up a copy of that because, uh, you know, everybody loves Jason Sanford stories. And I think it's time to roll the tape. Krista woke in the muck of flood and forest, wood and branches. Her body hung on a snag along the river with her face barely above water. She tried breathing, but couldn't move. No air entered her stiff body. Her skin blew. Her eyes glazed so she couldn't see. She had died. She knew it. And she was still dead. But even though she couldn't scent or see or hear, she was aware of those senses as if alive. Red Day was somehow helping her sense beyond herself. Without breathing, she smelled shit and decay and dead fish, a scent which laughed at her as she realized it was her own deathly stench. Krista called to Red Day, but heard no answer. Still, she felt the blood AI deep within her, wounded and near death, but also fighting to survive. Krista's body hung on the snag for hours, the fish biting at her rubber legs, a turtle resting on her head. She was about to give up on ever again living when hands pulled her out of the water. Strong hands. Hands controlled by a downy face with eagle eyes. You better not be dead dead, Jennery Flats hissed. You better not be after all I risked to help you. Krista couldn't answer. But if her body had been capable of movement, she would have smiled. Jennery spent the next few days nursing Krista back to life in a burrow the bird woman dug into the riverbank sand and clay. A small fire cracked and smoked softly its heat providing enough energy for the blood AI to slowly heal Krista's body. Once Krista could move a bit, Jennery brought her food and water, which gave her more strength. And the stronger she became, the stronger Red Day also became, in a wondrous loop of life and living. How did you find me? Krista eventually asked when her body was healed enough to exhale air and move her lips. I don't know. Jennery said. When you were attacked, I ran, but something told me to go downstream to start searching the river for your body. That was me, Red Day whispered. When I realized we'd been tricked, I didn't recall the drop of blood you'd used to access Jennery's memories. It told Jennery the only way we'd survive would be to jump in the river. That's why she looked for us. Krista was impressed at Red Day's foresight. Krista hadn't even considered jumping in the river until she found herself on the dam and Red Day suggested it. Subtle. Almost as subtle as her village AI when it tricked her into becoming a plague bird. Or Dawnbringer reworking her mind so she'd share in its dreams. Subtle is what AIs do best, Red Day said. Steel doesn't make it right, Krista thought, before her injured body pulled her back to sleep.
During the following weeks, Jennery twice dug a new den and moved Krista there in the middle of the night. She disguised the tiny opening of each den with plants and leaves, and after placing Krista inside, washed away their faint scent with water and crushed berries. Without needing to ask, Krista knew they were being hunted. One day, Jennery returned to the den with a haunch of deer meat and an ancient ceramic bucket filled with water. Is this enough to finish healing? Jennery asked. Red Day whispered yes. All we need at this point is time, it said, and Krista nodded her head. Where are you going? Away. The alderman and his hunt are searching the area. I can't let them catch me. Krista understood. Which path will you take? Downstream. Find a village to take me. If not, there's always the hunt. Krista tried to reach for Jennery, to touch her, to thank her, but her body was still too stiff. To Krista's surprise, Red Day stirred with concern for Jennery. You must walk fast, the A.I. said with Krista's mouth. If we fight Dawnbringer, it might not be safe anywhere in this valley. Jennery stared at Krista, knowing this wasn't her speaking and no doubt wondering about the coming battle. But Jenry didn't protest the advice. She merely muttered agreement and fled the burrow. In the darkness of the den, Krista tracked time by the decay of the deer meat beside her. First came stench, then flies, then maggots. Then nothing but bone to gnaw. She occasionally heard the alderman and his hunt pass nearby, but Jennery had done a good job hiding the burrow, and they never found her. And to Krista and Red Day's great fortune, Dawnbringer wasn't with the villagers. Still, Red Day sensed them calling to the AI using the green tattoos on their faces. Imprintable transmitter receivers, Red Day said. It's old space travel technology. I would have realized this earlier if Dawnbringer hadn't manipulated me. In addition to calling Dawnbringer, the alderman and his hunt also called to Krista. They implored her to join them. The stars! The alderman yelled. Dawnbringer promises you nothing less than the stars themselves! It was a testament to the dream Dawnbringer had showed Krista that she had to fight to keep from calling out to the alderman that she bit her lip not to scream out that she did indeed want the stars. But despite this danger and her craving for Dawnbringer's dream, Krista still enjoyed her days underground. Never mind that fleas bit her and she stank like the dead. She remembered the old stories her parents told her as a child, how their wolf ancestors had grown up in countless holes like this. She dreamed about all the humans and wolves whose genes had eventually merged to create her, and felt like she was yet another in a long line of cubs waiting to emerge into the calm of life. Red Day, though, was anything but calm. The A.I. twisted inside her, frustrated by being forced to live within such a weakened shell. Red Day's strength was tied to her own, But in its memories, she tasted the old days when AIs hadn't been so restricted. They'd tapped power sources beyond Krista's imagining, fueling abilities which boldly matched the dazzling dreams of humanity. Like Dawnbringer, as Krista slipped in and out of delirious dreams, she saw the green AI's life. It had controlled the first ship sent to a distant star system. However, a collision as the ship neared its destination killed the crew. Alone, desperate to complete its mission, Dawnbringer looped its damaged ship around that alien star and slingshot it home, returning to Earth 3,000 years after it left. But instead of the thriving world the AI remembered, it discovered a destroyed humanity. That's what's wrong. Red Day whispered to Krista. This Dawnbringer is indeed one of the original AIs. To stop it, we have to remove the power that's feeding it. 
Krista woke to tears on her face. A good sign because it meant her body had healed enough to waste water on sorrow. From outside the burrow, she'd heard the distant howls of the alderman and his hunt. Why doesn't Downbringer guide them to us? She asked. It can't stray far from home, Red Day said. That's where its power is. And while Dawnbringer is powerful, its senses are weak. It also lacks my ability to place pieces of itself in others. So while Dawnbringer can manipulate minds, it can only do that in close proximity to its target, or when using those tattooed transmitters as an amplifier. That's why it's relying on the alderman and his hunt to find us. Krista remembered the spaceship and knew that was the home Red Day referred to. Was that a true dream? Yes, in case we survived its initial trap. When Dawnbringer first touched us, it implanted a memory kernel in our minds. Now that we've healed enough to again threaten it, Dawnbringer wants us to understand its needs, to join it, or leave it alone so it can complete its mission. The stars, Krista thought, the aftertaste of Dawnbringer's dream burning in her. The A.I. wanted to rework a group of humans into the powerful creatures Krista's species had once been. Dawnbringer would then take those humans back into space to complete its mission. Krista wished with all her being she could be on that ship when it left Earth. She also wondered if that was truly her dream or only something Dawnbringer had inserted in her. I can't answer, Red Day said, embarrassed. I was as affected as you. Krista stretched, grinning as she realized her body no longer hurt. She knew where Dawnbringer had hidden its ship. Red Day had figured out the same thing when it warned Jennery not to follow the river. Krista picked up the worn deer bone and gnawed on it. A few more days of healing, and she'd leave the burrow. And then they'd see about Dawnbringer and this dream. When Krista finally left the burrow and began hiking back to Dawnbringer's village, she told Red Day of an old game called chess. Her village AI had taught her the game as a child. It's a quirky contest where players map out moves with cunning and subtlety, she said. I'm familiar with chess, Red Day said snidely. It's a game in which no human has ever defeated an AI. Krista snorted and kicked at a dirt clod. <laughs> Above, the dam's massively clear wall screamed at her. It looked like a sky-tall wave about to scour away every bit of life in the valley. Through the dam's clear surface, Krista saw a distant, pale shape, almost as if a giant pebble had been skipped across the lake until it sank. No doubt this was Dawnbringer's spaceship. While Dawnbringer hadn't yet detected them, as Red Day had said, its senses were limited. Krista knew the alderman and his hunt were searching for her. As if to prove her right, when Krista rounded the next bend, three giant seal men climbed from the river. They howled at Krista and charged, running on all fours because it was difficult for them to stand upright out of water. Don't let them near us, Red Day said. Dawnbringer can use their imprinted transmitters to manipulate us. Then I suggest you do something before that happens, Krista said as she slit her wrist. Red Day instantly fell on the seal men, who screamed as the blood AI slashed the green tattoos off their cheeks before ripping their chests open and devouring their hearts. So much for surprise, Krista said when Red Day returned to her body. You know we can't defeat Dawnbringer directly, right? That's why we'll be subtle. <laughs> it was Red Day's moment to snort.
hum and drum, vibration and motion, the hot burn of smooth ceramics and nanofilaments, and of more power than Krista could imagine. The stars themselves spread before her like sparkling candy, only to melt to sugar in her mouth. She gasped as Red Day pulled back from the starship, leaving her sitting on top of the clear dam. Blue skies and a warm sun rose above Krista. Below her, water roared through the spillway, while in front, cormorants fished the glass-smooth waters. And far below that surface lay the spaceship Red Day had just scanned. Dawnbringer's waiting for us, Red Day said, where it can utilize the ship's full power. Was it able to access you? No. Dawnbringer knew I was there, but I pulled back before he could grab me. Krista caressed the dam's smooth nano-reinforced surface. Through Red Day's senses, she felt the nano bonds holding the dam together. So tiny, so individually unimportant, but together, strong enough to resist time itself. Don Bringer had chosen a great location to hide his ship. If Krista hadn't found that body and followed the river here, Don Bringer would have soon gened this group of humans to the point where they could join it for another trip to the stars. Perhaps Dawnbringer was correct. Perhaps the AI should be allowed to retool these humans and complete its mission. The AI's dream was hardly a bad one. But then Krista remembered the dead child. The child had been too human, which Dawnbringer didn't want. The AI wanted powerful, hybrid humans to take on the universe. So it had coldly forced the alderman to kill his own son to keep the village's gene pool pure. Krista sat on the dam all morning as the sun arched before her. She kept watch for the alderman and his fellow villagers, and especially the seal men, but none dared approach. Despite their loyalty to Dawnbringer, they were afraid to come near Krista now that she was back at full power. It was only at dusk that the alderman finally dared to walk out on the dam. If Dawnbringer accesses your tattoo, I'll kill you instantly. Krista yelled. The alderman bowed deeply, keeping his hands away from the green star tattoo on his face. After Red Day sensed that the imprinted transmitter receiver wasn't active, Krista waved for the alderman to approach. I've been asked to speak with you, he said, sitting down on the dam beside Krista. Dawnbringer doesn't desire to fight you. Surely you understand its needs. I do. It must be difficult to live your entire life aiming for one daring dream, and to give it up, not when it's in reach. The alderman growled with soft laughter. You do understand. They stared through the dam at the reflections below them. Krista saw a school of striped bass swim by. Did you know? This is where your son was killed. She asked. The alderman glanced back at the sheer drop and swallowed hard. I didn't know, he said. Does it bother you that your actions allowed my son's murderer to escape? Krista didn't answer. She knew Dawnbringer had reworked the alderman's memories. He didn't know that he'd killed his son. She wanted to reach out and hug him to tell him the truth, even as she forgave him for what Dawnbringer had made him do. But it wasn't yet time for that. I don't intend to fight Dawnbringer, Krista said. The alderman nodded his tiger-striped head. A wise choice. You can't win. Oh, I intend to win. I just don't see the need to fight. As she said this, 
red day surged from her body, smashing into the dam below them. For the last 12 hours, the blood AI had been subtly breaking the nanofilaments holding the dam together. Now its surge finished the job. Through the clearness below, Krista saw a crack smash through the dam. It reached from the bottom of the lake toward her in a finger-extending explosion of smaller cracks, like ice breaking outward before you fall into the frigid water. The alderman paled as the dam rang in hammering bursts. Krista grabbed the alderman's large hand and pulled him after her, running as fast as they could. Moments after they reached the shore, the dam collapsed. Krista stood on the shore with the aldermen and the villagers, who were too shocked to attack her or attempt to contact Dawnbring. The middle of the dam gave way first, the wall of water it held back surging forward and swirling the lake into a vortex. Ducks and cormorants took to panicked flight as fish jumped in feeble attempts to escape. And underneath the maelstrom, the bright green lights of Dawnbringer desperately trying to launch its ship. The ship was smaller than Krista had imagined, maybe 200 yards long. It rose through the swirling water, fighting the current in its attempt to reach the air. Krista felt herself cheering for Dawnbringer, hoping its ship could escape, hoping it could go elsewhere in this world to find another group of humans to mold that Dawnbringer could complete its daring mission of reaching the stars. But she knew Dawnbringer didn't have a chance. The ship had barely reached the surface when the entire dam gave way. The lake surged forward as the ship's faint green light screamed in sadness before being carried into the valley below and smashed on the rocks. Two nights later, Krista stood on the village's dirt stage with the aldermen. Krista had restored the villagers' memories of what Dawnbringer had done. The alderman had, of course, cried for hours over the loss of his son. When he'd recovered, he asked politely to stand by Krista when she imposed her punishment on the rogue A.I. Dawnbringer floated across the field toward the stage, its glow now only a faint green without the ship's power to feed it. Red Day scanned the AI and confirmed it had indeed left none of itself behind in the wreckage of the ship. It was honoring their agreement. When Krista had found the remains of the ship, Dawnbringer was waiting for her, projecting an image of green rain caressing the ground. Its version of crying, perhaps. Red Day had yearned to attack, but Krista said no. While Dawnbringer was now powerless before them, she still felt the passion of its dream. She didn't want that dream to die along with Dawnbringer. Now what? Krista asked the AI. Dawnbringer begged Krista and Red Day to let it remain with the villagers, to let it finish remolding them into what humanity had once been. We will rebuild the ship, it said. I will rebuild their minds. We will finish my mission. I can't allow that, Krista said. But perhaps there is something we can do. Now Krista stood yet again on the village commons, waiting to enact punishment. As Dawnbringer floated over, she allowed the AI to touch its villagers one final time. The AI rose above its charges and fell across their heads like the green rain of its tears. The rain fell into their minds to the taste of dreams. 
a dream of all that humans and AI had once achieved. How there could again be a glorious future if the villagers worked toward it. How their children could one day build the world up and return to the stars. The AI then retreated back into itself with a quick motion. Krista slashed her wrist with her knife, releasing Red Day in a spasm of mist, which shot toward the green AI. Dawnbringer screamed as Red Day tore it apart on every level of its existence. The villagers remained silent until the blood AI finished and returned to Krista's body. Then the alderman howled, followed by the other villagers. Even though the wolf inside Krista begged to join in, she refused to allow it. After all, she was now a plague bird. And what was a plague bird if people didn't fear her? Jennery Flats wasn't happy to see Krista. I finally make a new home and you drag this onto me. She complained. Krista and Jennery stood in the commons of Farside, a small village two weeks' hike from where Krista had destroyed Dawnbringer. While Farside was small, the village appeared well-kept, with neat houses and crops, an attentive purple A.I., who obviously doted on its charges. Krista was impressed that Jennery had been able to hike so far while pregnant but the bird woman was nothing if not determined. Jennery wore a new cotton dress, which her large belly pushed against. Through the thin fabric, Krista could see the downy feathers covering Jennery's skin. The AI here barely agreed to accept me into its village, Jennery said. Why should I stick my neck out by vouching for them? Jennery referred to the people from her old village, who sat meekly behind Krista. A handful of the villagers had returned to the hunt after Krista killed Dawnbringer. However, most, including the aldermen, had followed Krista here. Krista glanced at the villagers, who gazed in envy at the neat houses and fields around them. For a moment, Red Day whispered that Krista should simply use their powers to convince Jennery to vouch for the villagers. Or they could alternately rework the mind of this village AI and make it yearn to take in these people. But Krista told the blood AI no. She was tired of subtle tricks. These people were treated as badly as you, she told Jennery. Glancing at the alderman's downcast face, she knew that was wrong. Worse, perhaps. Jennery picked at the down on her face before sighing. <sighs> I guess if you're willing to vouch for them, it couldn't hurt for me to do the same. Jennery walked over to the village AI, which glowed an even deeper purple as it listened. The AI was obviously impressed Krista hadn't attempted to force the newcomers on it. Once Jennery was finished speaking, the village AI floated over. What about the dream this rogue AI placed in their minds? The purple AI whispered. If you wish, I can remove it. No. Krista said. That was our agreement. The villagers must remember Downbringer's dream. Maybe it will motivate them. Maybe it won't. But the dream stays. The purple AI agreed and said it would gladly accept the newcomers. Satisfied, Krista ordered Red Day to remove her from everyone's senses. Unseen, she slipped out of the village. You realize there's nothing wrong with being subtle, Red Day said. After all, returning your people to true humanity is nothing, if not a subtle job. Perhaps. But maybe things will work better by simply stating up front what we want. In the back of Krista's mind, the blood AI chuckled. <laughs> Naive, it said. As Krista ran toward the forest behind the village, rejoicing in being free to again give in to her own animal instincts, the red day flashed through the dream Dawnbringer had given the villagers. Perhaps, red day said, 
The most subtle tricks are the dreams we share. Krista stopped and looked back at the beautiful village. She stared at the perfect roofs rising in tiny triangles above the trees and fields and listened to the sounds of children laughing. The blood AI was right. Even now, the aldermen and the other villagers would be sharing Dawnbringer's dream with their new neighbors. Even with the green AI dead, its needs would live on. I promise you this, Red Day said. One day we'll be forced to return and deal with this dream all over again. All Krista could do was nod her head in agreement and hope that day wasn't any time soon. Author's Note This is Jason Sanford, author of The Ever-Dreaming Verdict of Plagues, which you just heard. Uh, This is the point in the program where I'm supposed to give an afterword, give you my thoughts, explain the story, babble on and on about great authorial insights into whatever you care to know, and I got nothing. Literally, blank. I threw everything I had into that story, so if you didn't get it, I can't help you. But uh, I can tell you that I really had a blast writing that story, and I appreciate the Dune Steve people for publishing it and making it into yet again another awesome podcast. I am working on sequels to the first two stories in the uh, Plague Bird sequence. Um, the next story um, is going to introduce a new character called Diver, who is part human and part alien. Uh, and from there, we're going to go on uh, basically following Christina DeAnne's first few years as a plague bird. Uh, we'll find out that the uh, plague bird AI inside her, Red Day, is not quite as powerful as Christina DeAnne thinks at this point. Turns out there are plague birds in the world that are much, much more powerful. In fact, uh, Red Day is probably on the lower end of the power scale, which is probably why he has a bit of a ego and a, a big mouth. Anyway, but it's, uh, it's I'm having a blast writing these stories. I hope you're enjoying listening to them. And uh, when I'm finished, there will at least be a novel's worth of stories uh, around this character in sequence. And uh, if people like it, I'll keep going. So thanks again, and uh, keep tuned. Take care. Bye-bye. Welcome back, everybody. So did you like the story? I did. But you already knew that, because I told you it was like... Butter. It was like Dark Knight to the Batman Begins or something. Or what, we never really cleared that up, did we? Well, it was either like Wrath of Khan to Motion Picture or Dark Knight to Batman Begins. I wanted to say that it was Dark Knight to Batman Begins because Plague Birds was not motion picture. That was not really a very good movie, but Plague Birds was a good story. So Yeah, and it's hard. You know, everybody has certain things that speak to them. But I found this story much more engaging, and I found the, the two... AIs. I almost said the good AI and the evil AI, but to think of Red Sun, Red, Day. to think of Red Day as a good AI is just like wow. Because I mean, he's a cold-blooded bastard, and uh, you know, with the <laughs> he giggled maniacally. Or he whatever. did a lot of cackling. I think. Oh, is that might, what it was? You but, might call it maniacal laugh, maniacal laugh, and fade to black. There was just new elements that had been added to it. And I enjoyed that relationship between Krista and Red Day because in part, Red Day is her protector, Mm -hmm. you know, and he's the person that knows her and accompanies her. And he is her power. He's her mentor. You know, he's teaching her. He's telling her things. You know, he's he's keeping watch for her. But at the same time. He's he's trying to push her to kill and to, to, to she's she, he's like the the evil Donald Duck on her shoulder. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I, I I'm sure there are many times that, that Krista wishes that he weren't around. And is it he or it in the story itself? Red Day. Yes. Is it? I don't know if they ever. Uh, you know, I don't pay attention to see if he has a gender or not. I don't know. The, but the relationship there was really interesting to me. And then all of a sudden, you've got green. Peace. Dawn Bringer. And then all of a sudden you've got Dawn Bringer, who's a different kind of an AI, a, a more powerful in a way AI, a much older, craftier even AI. And it makes 
Krista and the the reader look at Red Dawn, Red Dust, Red <laughs> D- Red Son of Krypton, Red Red Day. It makes Red Krista Dawn. look at Red Day in a totally new light. It's like, okay, the the devil I know is better than the devil I don't know, kind of thing. And and the thing that's interesting about Day Day Stalker, <laughs> Day. Dale. Day, day tripper, Dawnbringer. The interesting thing about Dawnbringer is that he's subtle and he's crafty and he whispers and he's, and he's a, a Sunday driver. He, yeah, he's a flatterer. You know what I mean? He tells you what you want to hear or or makes you think that you want to hear yeah. things that you don't even know. So he makes you believe the lie. How much more intimidating a villain is that? is somebody who comes to you in the guise of a friend and puts his arm around you. And the second he touches you, you want to do what he says and all that. Yeah. That, I, I don't, I don't yeah, know. It's like that's a, something that spoke to me. It's like an infomercial host or something. That's what Dawnbringer is. The one second you're, you don't need a slap chopper. What are those things called? Are they called slap chop? Is that where they French tickler? It? I think is what you're looking, thinking of. <laughs> yes, that was it. <laughs> but you don't need a sham wow. And then all of a sudden you, you watch the thing and you're like, I think I need a, a couple of these sham wows. Oh, good. Honey, I just ordered three slankets. I hope that's okay. <laughs> well, it I, turns out that if you order within the next 10 minutes, you get a second slanket for free. So you're okay. So I ordered eight. <laughs> but um, <laughs> something that Jason said in the author's note was if people like this story, I, I will write more, right? What was the words exactly? Do you remember? Yes, it was, uh, I don't remember the exact words, no, but it was something like that. And, and so we're going to take a poll. It, yeah, as soon as he <laughs> said it, you and I were, were like, well, well, how does, or, or I guess I was, because I talked your ear off about it. Check the outtakes. I thought, well, how will he know <laughs> if people liked it? Who are the people he's talking about? Because it, he sold it to Interzone. It's a short story collection or a magazine but I imagine there's not 15 pages of letters to the editor saying, by gum, I sure liked that Plague Bird story. Is he asking our listeners to say, hey, Jason, I dug that story. Please write more. Is he just saying, you know, the people on the street, the people that he knows, if they like it, who are the pe- Where does the responsibility lie? Because I want more story. <laughs> well, say it now. Say I liked it. There's one vote for Oh, I, I don't know that I could commit myself that. It's, it's not an election year, but people are acting like it is. So on the off chance that Jason doesn't get a lot of feedback from people on the street or in the supermarket or at the those big trough urinals, please post that if you liked the story, give him a little bit of feedback on That's that. Where in I, the, where in I the always get my best forum. feedback is at the trough urinal. <laughs> Looking pretty good, Anklevich. When was the last time that you had to urinate in a trough urinal? Jeez, it was probably the nineties. Really? Yeah. I it was eighties for me. It was like early eighties too, barely eighties. I swear I think it was Candlestick Park when I went to a Giants game in like eighty four or perhaps even earlier when I was a little kid and I was standing at the friggin' trough urinal next to a bunch of dudes that had been drinking beer the whole night long. I was just like, first of all, how can you pee that long? And secondly, (laughs) get me out of here. Is this an outtake? It's up to you. I, well, I, I don't remember if Dodger Stadium had the troughs or not, but I think these days definitely it's probably updated. There. Those trough urinals are, are things of the past. Well, it was, That's why I was asking and was amazed when you said it was the 90s. It was meant to be funny, sir. I, well, the way that you introduced Jason, I sort of wanted to touch on that, too. You know, I really appreciate that he sent us these stories, that he continues to send us the stories. And I mean, I hope, I, I guess it's an assumption that he will continue to do so that when he does sell another Plague Bird story, he'll give us the audio rights to do. And, and you know, maybe that is presumptive on my part. But I think he appreciates the work that goes into them. You know, the work that Brian does, the work that we do. A lot of people like L. Scribe Harris has been Krista in three episodes now. And I would hope that she'll continue to do it as long as she's available to. And to me, that, that that's so important. The continuity of voice actors from, or, you know, I, I think of it in 
terms of film, but we talk about that. You know, you want to see the same part being played by the same actor in sequels and all right. that. It just irritates you, or at least me. I always question, like, why? Why is Katie Holmes not yeah, Rachel? Why is she this? not why, back again? Know, why is James Rhodes a different guy? And, and a lot of times it's politics or it's wanting money or whatever the deal is. But it's just, it's, it's sad that it can't always be the same person because you have to trick your mind into believing it's the same person. Yeah, at a certain point, you're like, nah, okay. Especially at the start or when you hear about it beforehand, you're like, oh, really? So it's Val Kilmer this time? Oh. 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 Some people really liked Val Kilmer. <laughs> not, not I, but... Not as Batman. He was good in uh, Real Genius. So anyways, one thing that we missed, and I figured before we get too much further, I would like to uh, bust it out, is we always do the cast list after the story. Oh, yeah, that's important. This time around, we're, go- we're doing in the middle of the post show, the cast list, <laughs> because we're way past after the story. But I'd say that that doesn't have the same ring to it, but it does. <laughs> it's just a terrible Yeah, ring. there's no ring. The ring was bad to begin with, so. One ring. To rule them all. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all. And in the darkness blind them? Yay! The narrator for today's story was Big Anklevich. L. Scribe Harris did the voice of Krista. Veronica Belmont was back again to play Jennery Flats. Paul Coor was the alderman. And James David Jackson was the voice of Dawnbringer. And Brian Lincoln threw his voice into the ring for a couple of... He was the turnip man. Background characters. He was the seal man and the purple AI. Oh, and uh, there was also the blood AI. Oh, whoever Brian got to be the blood... To be Red Day. Red Day is right, the blood Red AI. Right, Red Day is the blood that, AI. Dude, that guy ruled, man. Okay, there's that part where he's like all hurt. Uh-huh. He's, he's dying and he's trying to heal Krista and he's like, I have done what i can plague bird or whatever i was just like oh my gosh that really that, sounds like he's weakening that sounds and a, I, that's a really re- i i i whoever did that really friggin parsic award that's a good impression what, of that guy to tell you the truth I, no i didn't do you, it justice but this guy needs to be a professional actor a professional voiceover a professional narrator a prof- somebody yeah. that lies with women for money <laughs> is does. what i'm looking for the word yeah you do I, impressions of people and like your sean connery and stuff way off but that that impression you just did of that blood AI that was really good. And yeah, blood AI was played by Rish Outfield. Oh, okay. Well, never mind. All of that stuff I just said. Lame. Yeah, we weren't minding to begin with. <sighs> so anyways, that was our cast list for today's story. That was our second ever two-part episode. Do you think it was the right decision to split it? I think it was. It, it would have been pretty long otherwise. Well, you gave me some time to edit the post too because right. just, I've been a little overwhelmed on that. Yeah, and now I can't. I, 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 gosh, can't I think hope why. it hasn't been like a month in between the two episodes. But if it has, your fault. Well, there you go. I have heard that there will be murder in the streets if it takes that long, though. So you better not, oh. for the sake of humanity, edit fast. Okay, I'm not a fan of murder in the streets. Dancing in the streets, I'm down with. Murder in the streets, not so much. It depends on the dancing. Polka dancing, it's not, not, not my bag, baby. So, again, thank you, Brian Lincoln. Thank you to the people that he got to do the voices. Again, we mentioned Veronica Belmont last week. 1.6 million Twitter <laughs> followers. What would you do with 1.6 million Twitter followers? I would tell them to all send me $1 each. And see if that works. If you had as good of hair as she does, it would work. Yeah? Hey, if you're new to the show and you came over here via Veronica, stay a while. It's not always as Rish Outfield heavy as... Okay, it is. It's always always me. I love to just chatter on. I'm like one of those uh, chatty Kathy dolls. Am I dating myself? Because no one else will date me. But the chatty Kathy had the... The string in the back and you pulled it and it's like i love you you're the best mommy yes. ever yeah. kill for yeah. me you know woody has something like that too only it sounds like a car ran over it 
And that's probably a Toy Story reference. It is, as a matter of fact. You know, one thing that I thought was totally awesome, and it's kind of funny to be talking about it now because it was actually in last episode, but talking about Brian Lincoln's production of this whole story, the moment that we ended on at the end of the last episode where uh, Krista is falling off of the, the dam and she's in the water and huge swell of water that she can't keep herself above water on. And you hear the just freaking amazing sound effects that he had where she's going and you hear her get her head out of water. And she gasps and then it's... And then finally, I, you know... I said, yeah, and she truly died. Oh my gosh, that moment was so awesome. When you got to the end of that, and you're just like, ooh, like. I even pressed like when, when, I, when I saw that. But yeah, it was so good. That bit there, oh man, it blew me away. Here and there, you know, our various producers will do stuff in their episodes for us. And I'm just thinking, man, that is so good. I wish that I had ever gotten that good when I still produce stuff for our show. Well, it's hard. It's not just something that you can do with your own voice. You have to go out there and find right. the sound of water. You, you have to get the girl or the man or the you know person to do a performance of the gasping. Right. And that has to be of a certain quality. And sometimes, and I know we've talked about this before, but sometimes people aren't willing to just throw themselves into the part because you know you have to yeah, the, just set aside your pride the or gasping and screaming and, and vomiting, vomiting and burping and, and puking like that. And it's not for everybody not everybody can just set aside the, the their inhibitions and right. go for it and sometimes it's hard to ask somebody to do that right. and then also the music and also just choosing where to put sound effects and where not to it's really easy to listen to and and notice when things aren't there right. or, or or you know it's easy to notice if it doesn't work but if it does work it might have taken a whole hour just for a just, you know yeah, five for a one minute part. sequence and it just washes over you as reality like it actually happened and you never it didn't take any work at all and sometimes that can be really daunting and, and and I don't like to edit stories because I'm a perfectionist and I'm not willing to dedicate the amount of time for things to be perfect. I, I mean, who is, you would have to have that as your job. And even so, you know, some people would slack off and other people would be like, well, let's watch the clock. And, and once my time is up, I'm done. You know, there's different levels of done. And, yeah. and so thank you to Brian who just, dove into this and i don't think he complained at all that it was harder and and you know what maybe it wasn't as hard as the first plague words but i oh, imagine you, you should have seen his tweets oh okay it was just like that damn rich outfield making me do this story i don't burn remember and tell mother uh, is that what he said can you fit that on the <laughs> well it was, there was several characters there was several tweets twitter each one was like, Rich Outfield is A, and then, you know, I just kept going. No, yeah, he did a great job. And the cool thing about a Brian Lincoln produced story is over on his own podcast, which is the Full Cast Podcast, he will do sort of a post-mortem type of an episode where he'll say, okay, so I did this story for Steve, and here are the things that I learned from it. You know, maybe he'll talk about how he managed that water stuff. Did you record your own sound effects? Did you find them on free sound? Or where did that stuff come from? Because that was amazing. It's funny because it's been a long time since I produced an roll. episode. I mean, the last one that I did was the episode right before Plague Birds uh, Part 1. I did that Save the date. question episode. Save the Damn Date it. was by uh, Ken Crawford. It was funny because, you know, I hadn't done it in such a long time that I sat down and I started going. You know, that story starts out with a lot of... Here's a vignette of what happened with the robots here. Here's another vignette of what happened with them here. I started going on that and I was like, oh, okay, I need this sound effect. Oh, oh, I need a crowd screaming. Oh, okay, now I need a buzz saw going, you know, and pretty soon I was just like, oh, now I remember why I let other people produce the shows because this is time consuming. This takes a lot of work. So big ups to Brian Lincoln. And along those lines... Like I said, it is work and, and it's something that you can spend forever 
<laughs> working on, depending on how in depth that you want it to be. I mean, you can make a cacophony of sound to the point where it's the diminishing returns begins to happen. Uh, kind of like if you watch a Michael Bay Transformers thing where there's a billion things happen, or, or George Lucas prequel where there's a billion things happening on the screen. What suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, that, that, that's good. That show, by the way, returns March 15th, I believe, which is the yeah. Ides of March. If which you, is when you must have your uh, broken mirror stories read by. Don't give me that crap. If you are a Nielsen family and you like us at all, please watch Community. I would like that show to. Please, please watch Community. Anyhow, you can totally immerse yourself in the audio experience and editing and all that. But if you are a listener and that sounds like something you would like to do, like to try it. You can create your own podcast or you can volunteer to produce something for us. And we always need new producers. Because we're burning them out like matchsticks, man. It's Well, it, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to pretend that it's not work. And the one that I've been working on, I volunteered in August, I think, that I would do it. And I just barely got the last voice track in. And I just, I'm worried about how much work it's going to be. And then I'm not going to do a good enough job. And that people are going to say, get out of here, kid. You got no future. And that no one will ever sleep. Can't well, take that rejection. But these are things I worry about. And so if you would like to try that, go ahead and, and let us know. It's at editor at doonsteef.com. We have other stories and uh, it would be neat to uh, add you to our list of producers. Yeah. And express yourself creatively in that way. Especially if you would like to do what we do. But you don't have any idea how much work it's going to be. <laughs> this will be a glimpse. Yeah, you definitely want to do a uh, a trial period. It's like moving in with someone before getting married or something. And then you realize, oh, yeah, that guy's a douche. I'm not going to. That guy bites his toenails. I'm not going to go with I, that. I, that's, I that's too much. I can't be with somebody who. <laughs> or wait, wait, whatever. Wait, I'm sorry. Is that the... a deal breaker for you? If your woman bit her toenails or, or insisted on biting yours, would that upset you? Um probably would biting toenails is a strange biting fingernails is one thing because there's not going to be the possibility of whatever shoe fungus, fungus etc toe jam football going on in there uh so anyways <laughs> check it out uh you know why not give it a shot if you know what i'm saying there you go you know that's something that you were saying today is how much more gas is there in the tank maybe we'll talk about that in a that gets my goat or something oh, yeah, like that you know, I mean, how much longer are we going to do this podcast? And my answer was, well, hopefully if people continue to volunteer to produce or whatever, the, some of the onus will be off your back and that you won't think that it's a burden and that we will continue to do the show. You know, is that uh -huh. accurate? Yeah, I suppose so. We appreciate the hell out of the people that volunteer. Right. The show would have ended probably a year ago at least if it weren't for the, the people that are producing for us. So there's that. Definitely, it has prolonged the life of our little podcast. But as far as that goes, coming up here fairly soon, we'll have our Broken Mirror episodes. And yeah, if you want to produce one of those, you know, you get a chance to produce something perhaps done by one of your peers because those Broken Mirror stories are all just written by listeners of the show. And I think some of them, I haven't read them all, darn it. I think you're Hardly all waiting on me. Any. But some of them are short. True. We'll see. I mean, if the length daunts you, then date me. No, if you would be afraid to edit something, to produce something as long as Plague Birds, there might be shorter pieces out there that you could volunteer to do. <laughs> or there might be longer ones. Oh, are there longer than... There's some pretty damned long ones in the Broken Mirror stories. Just wait till you get to them. Remember the book worth of papers that I handed you today? <laughs> That's not even all the stories. You've already read six of them. So so that's something that you can volunteer to do as well. And it just, it helps out. And another way that you can help out is by doing episode art. We had two people do art for ever changing winds of time. What was it called? <laughs> 
it was called the ever dreaming verdict of plagues and yes we had two separate listeners who like doing art that we asked if they would do the art for these stories and we, it, it was really nice of them because you know we didn't give them a lot of time to try and get it out we said okay if you can get this one back as soon as you can and you can get it back a week after as soon as you can they really went for it uh today's art was by gino moretto and he did a pretty good job i really like the way this turned out this was your uh request right I guess they both were. Yeah. Oh, they both were. Okay. But yeah, in this case, yeah, you requested it looks like a dam made of glass. Yeah. You you were having family things going on. And so I sort of tried to take it upon myself to prepare these. Because usually you handle the, oh, will you do art, et cetera, uh-huh. kind of thing, unless I draw it myself. Yeah, that does and, happen uh, occasionally. And so I asked these two people if they would do it on the same day. And I just assumed whichever one comes in first will be the first one. And when the one that comes in second would be the, <laughs> the second. And uh, I think Gino wasn't aware of that. Yeah, and I so don't think he saw was. Melissa Hill's art for the first episode. And it was for the same story that I had asked him to do. And he's just like, oh, I thought I had more time. Oh, crap. They just went ahead without me. Well, I'm pissed. Well, see, that's something <laughs> a Starship Sofa would do. We We wouldn't do that. <laughs> And I feel bad that he felt, even for a minute, that we had screwed him over. Yeah, I thought that was funny. I was like, no, no. And luckily, I I think I saw it within, you know, a few hours of him posting that. But I said, yeah, no, no, you're you're part two. And I was most afraid of him going, oh, F those Dune Steve guys. Guess I'll delete this crap. Oh, and it takes all the do. work. You that do that all the time. You're done. It's like, and I'm going to show it. you who's immature. Delete. And it's like, dude, we spent six weeks on that. <laughs> and yeah, I was so afraid that he would just be like, oh, I guess they don't need my stuff. And so he deleted it. And then we're like, hey, where's that part two art you were going to give us? And he's like, oh. So luckily, <laughs> we got to him before he did that. He got us the finished product before the deadline, too. Yeah. So, I mean, both of them in very little time did very different works of art. What was the name of the guy who drew the bird lady for Melissa? Unfortunately, we didn't. We recorded before we could mention the guy's name, but last week's art, Adam Jarvis, was the guy who drew the actual picture of the. Eagle slash tiger. Jennery Flats. Jennery Flats was her name, yes. But And what I had wanted to do is, is if we had had like an extra week, I was going to take Veronica Belmont's face and put like bird features on it and stuff like that. <laughs> and so what she did was kind of my description of what I had in mind. But it's just, yeah, there's too many plates to spin. Uh, I wasn't able to do any art. And Honestly, this probably looks a lot better than what I would have created. So. Yeah, we've seen it's, some of the other things you create, so we can probably answer that. Ooh, monster, if you want to see my latest art, donate to the show and we'll send you uh, the You've Got a Friend and I did the episode art. That's right. He did the episode art. And that, that yeah, you donate to the show and you will receive that episode and if you have already donated to the show and you're waiting to receive that it is coming i swear if you could just stop having children spark <laughs> we would be listening to that even now yes but i swear it will be coming very soon and i'm so close to finish well, hopefully it. before this even airs yeah yeah okay. that, that hopefully it will because it's basically the thing i need to work on now so that will be the thing that i will be avoiding therefore I hear you. That's me too. There's so many things that I need to be working on, but instead it's like, well, let's see if I can beat my high score on Galaga. (laughs) That brings us to the end of the show. So we don't really have much more to say. Well, Uh, I'm sure we can come up with more. So let's cut ourselves short. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Let people go their way. But hey, thank you. If you've listened all the way to the end and if you've helped us in some way, that's kind of what this episode has been about. Just thanking people. Thanks. It's really cool that we have people that like what we do and appreciate the work that Jason does or Brian does or we do. And you guys rock. Yeah. Thanks for listening, folks. And uh, have a wonderful rest of the day. I'm Big Anklevich. I'm Rich Outfield. Good night. Why not? Why not continue talking? Okay. Do you have something to say about today's episode? Drop by our website at dunesteef.com and leave a comment. 
The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. You may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Wow, today's show sucks more than a Bruce Springsteen song covered by Kesha. Take two. Together, we're gonna find our way. Uh. Wait, that was Charlton Heston for some reason. You damn dirty ape. But what did it blow? Your skin blew chunks. That's a it's, sentence. It's your job to sell that so the audience knows it's B-L-U-E. That's a sentence. Her skin blue is yes. a sentence. This <laughs> it's guy, not a verb. This guy is a writer. I guess. It's, he's allowed to do that. <laughs> Without breathing, she smelled shit and decay and dead fish and Rish Outfield's ass. It was a vile thing to wake up from death to. Well, I, I'm really low on toilet paper and sometimes you, you just can't wipe enough. You could wipe for a half an hour and it... Is that an overshare? I'm sorry. <laughs> Especially when you don't have toilet paper. What are you wiping with? Hand. Rabbit fur. Ah, it all comes back to rabbit fur. I guess we'll find out after my butt stops. Don't, please don't fire it. After my butt stops hurting. Your butt will never stop hurting. Not until you bury the source of the pain. Okay. I'm trying to be Sorry, the Jennery's, the Jennery's memories things just makes me laugh. Oh. <laughs> to access her, her scrapbook store, Jennery's memories. <laughs> Who is it that says that? Tigger, right? I hate Tigger. <laughs> Where are you going? Going to your mom's house. Hey. Ba-boom. That's right. Andrew Dice Clay, eat your heart out. Your mama's so poor, she walked down the street with one shoe, and they asked, did you lose one? She says, no, I found one. Well, wasn't it, uh, how did he finish? It was, uh, what's his face? Now I can't think of his name. Forget it. Moving on. That's so weird that <coughs> he said it with her mouth. Almost makes me think I should read it, too, in case he wants that underneath it. But Nah. F him. I don't care what he wants, just like I don't care what you want. Hey, this guy works hard for our show, unlike some. <laughs> he works hard for his money. That's right. So hard for you, honey. So hard for it, honey. Do, do, do. I guess so you better, better treat, treat him, him right. right. <laughs> they implored her to join them. The stars. The... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh. Going down to meet an engine named Cicatrice. Do you really remember that show? How many times did they make us watch it? Oh, it must have been ten at least. I don't know. It was a lot. More times than I'd seen Star Wars. You take that back. <laughs> Don Bringer promises you nothing less than the stars themselves. Truly, he was king of the Jews. <laughs> Eva, I've told you that story before, right? Where Sisu B. DeMille came to him and, and said, cut, cut. And he said, uh, John, you do it, the line with more awe. And he says, okay, action. Ah, truly, he was <laughs> king of the <laughs> But she was tired of people inserting things in her hum and drum vibration and motion i'm sorry this is the fun v the hum drum v is back that way <laughs> it's iron man isn't it yeah i'll bet i'll bet if you put that in the forums no one would get it yeah you think so it's obscure okay well we'll see if i can ever get somebody else's so i can do so
Yeah, it's funny how often you have to give people clues to actually get it. You know, you, people see the thing and they're like, oh, it sounds familiar. But then what do you do? You go search Google and then you know what it is. But thank Buddha people don't just Google it and say, oh, I knew. Uh, you know what I mean? People are honest on the game. Right. But yeah, I wanted to give more quotes from Get Shorty before. Uh, yeah, I didn't. Instead, I just said, wise guys in Hollywood. And I went, oh, that's. I should have known. I gave it away. Because you used to talk. A lot about yeah. Get Shorty, but I it just I, I never saw it again. So yeah. I haven't seen it in a long time, though. So. Hum and drum. But yeah, I was going to use the quote where he goes, Yeah, they say the fucking smog is the fucking reason we got so much fucking beautiful fucking sunsets. <laughs> well, how did you put it? <laughs> I much? used the, uh, the previous version where the guy that's his driver in his car goes, they say the smog is the reason we have such beautiful sunsets. <laughs> and he goes, oh, is that right, huh? What a bunch of fucking bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> that character of Barboni just cracked me Who up. Who played him? I couldn't tell you the actor's name. I don't know. Oh, okay. It's not one of the main guys. Um, no, not like Danny DeVito or Rene Russo or anything like that. But he was the bad guy. But yeah, he would swear endlessly like so much just like you know they would get the r rating just from the one time where he's sitting on the crapper and the phone rings and he gets up and, goes, fuck, 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 and just says it like a hundred times as he walks out of the bathroom anyways <clears throat> these are my two gay sons hammer and drum C P ah. <laughs> That's like that bit on the uh, freaking hook. Roo, fee, oh! God, I hate hook. Please don't <laughs> remind me that hook exists. Ugh. Ugh. The movie sucks, dude. I've been asked to speak with you. He said. Let me do it, do it again when I'm not making noise, just in case. Oh, he's not really going to use me, is he? Maybe he likes John Wayne a lot. I've been asked to speak with you. Don Bringer doesn't desire to fight you. Surely you understand its needs. <laughs> I'm just guaranteeing <laughs> he doesn't. He's trying just... to make sure there's no way in hell. Hoping its ship could, es could escape. Punch the keys! <laughs> It's the Mace Windu AI. <laughs> this party's over. Motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> They're just not really good movies. No. And Mace Windu. The only thing cool about Mace Windu, I guess besides the purple lightsaber, is that Samuel L. Jackson plays him. Is bald. Head. He's just it's not a well written character. Was it you that was saying that they mentioned Mace Windu some? Yeah, in that first chapter of the Oh yeah, of the Alan Dean Foster uh, George uh, the uh, st first Star Wars book, yeah. And and Oh, my buttocks hurt like the dickens. My dickens hurt like the buttocks. <laughs> Here we are, face to face, couple of silver spoons. We should see if there's a heavy metal version of that. Hoping to find. We're hoping to find. We're two of a kind. Two of a kind. Oh, shoot. That's not what I wanted. Together. We're gonna find our way. Uh. Wait, that was Charlton Heston for some reason. You damn dirty ape. Uh, Here hello? we are, face to face, for a couple uh -oh, of super uh -oh. spoons. Ah. Sorry, ever since I was in like junior high, that was my go-to sound for heavy metal. Was that? Ah. I don't think any song ever actually used that. No. And then you're like, he doesn't oh. like you. I don't like you either. Can Geico save you a bunch of money? <laughs> What Does a bear it? shit in the woods? Does Richard Simmons have a distended rectum? 
And then you cut to, oh, Mr. Simmons, I've got some bad news for you. We're not, uh, we're not Abby Hilton, so we won't have a professional telling you what you have missed. Right? We might or have an we'll... amateur person doing that, but a professional, there's no professionals involved in our show. Oh, wait. I guess there might be some professionals involved in today. Uh, this is a kind of a weird situation here, actually, because, yeah, there are some professionals. Some people well, who get paid for things. With the exception by us. of me, I, I would think anybody has is a professional. So everybody has a profession, at least, oh. that works on this show. And I guess I get more of the proceeds that way. And Barnes and Noble doesn't shake them down for all the, the profit they could get. Uh, can you give me a, in one sentence what it might sound like for Barnes and Noble to shake someone down? Give me the keys, cocksucker. <laughs> that was just for my benefit. I I hoped you would do that. <laughs> Pre-recorded. You want to? Oh, can to I it? hear it? Because maybe there's something we can comment on. You have cannot you heard hear it? it. I have heard it, and it's all about the next Plague Bird story, if I remember right. Okay. Say hello to my little friend. They had to use that in the news today because for the millionth I was saying today, I was like, I think if there's any other line in film history that has been more used than that one, the only one I can think of is maybe like, no, I'm your father. No. Only one that could even come close to the one that's just... I mean, seriously, is there a single DreamWorks animated film that doesn't have Say Hello to My Little Friend in some way in it? And there's always, and then they like point and it's a midget or... And the friend says, hi, I'm his little friend. Didn't they use that in Austin Powers too? When Mini-Me uh, comes? Probably, but at some I, point? it might have been in the third Austin Powers because I don't know that one. But it's so not creative, but I wonder if it's because I'm a certain age... And Mirror Mirror is aimed for a younger audience. Somebody that's like, oh, that's the line from another cartoon that I saw. Whereas for me, it's just like, oh, that's the line that has been in so many movies that was originally in Scarface. But Oh, that's yeah. where we saw it most recently was Mirror Mirror. That's right. Oh, well, what were you talking about? Just everything. They oh, use that movie. I mean, they, they use that line the again that ends that and again trailer. and again, and, and I'm so sick of I it. I know this is outtakes and all that, but that's something that we've talked about time and time again. You end your trailer on a memorable moment or a memorable line that's going to keep people chuckling through the, the opening of the next preview. You, you, you want to end your trailer on your strongest moment. I still remember it back in 1987 seeing the Naked Gun trailer and at the very end of the Naked Gun trailer she says everybody deserves a friend like you and O.J. Simpson goes flying and screaming in the background. It was hilarious uh -huh. and it was this moment where when I saw Naked Gun when it finally came out I waited through the whole movie for that and that's how the movie ends but sometimes they'll end on the weakest most yeah, it makes me line. sad. And like, when they do, I want to shake them because, and you know what? I don't think it's just my opinion. It's just a fact that whatever you end with is the image that people remember. are going to be left with. And I remember the last Shrek movie ended. Yeah. The trailer the ended with the catastrophe. And the ridiculous. And, and I just. Oh, I like, man. Wow, did we grow up? I was like, one. wow. Uh, sometimes there'll be a kid's trailer. And it ends with some line and the audience laughs and some kid in the audience will repeat it because they think if they say it, they'll get a laugh as well. I've, I've heard that many times whenever uh -huh. I go to like a Pixar movie or something like that. And, you know, it's so weird to hear like a kid before a horror movie saying, your mom sucks cocks in hell. It's like, why? Who brought a five-year-old to this? Actually, they would have a Spanish accent, actually. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, to end. Say hello to my little friend. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah to, I, when they ended with that, that's that's become one of the things that we do these days. Now that I think about it, me and you, several times have been watching trailers and go, "Oh, really? You're going to end on that?" Well, how does the Avengers trailer end? Okay, the the, the most recent Avengers trailer ends with Loki saying, "I have an army," and Tony Stark says. We have a Hulk. And then you see the Hulk go, or whatever. 
it's just an awesome moment because it's amusing, but it's also, oh my gosh, our first glimpse of, of the green guy. Uh-huh. And you're just like, holy cow, that there's got to be a percentage of the audience that didn't know that the Hulk was in the movie because up to this point, he hadn't been rendered yet. He was, he's CG, he's added <laughs> right. later, you know, in all the promos and stuff that we haven't seen a Hulk. And it's just, it's, that's exactly what you want on a trailer. You want a button that gets people excited or talking or laughing. And, and I think that the, we have a Hulk line does all three of those. Because, you know, it's kind of snarky, uh, Joss whedon kind of thing to say. <laughs> and then, you know, it shows off the Hulk. And then it's also, oh, I didn't know that Hulk was in this too neat. Anyhow, I just, I, I feel like. Like what? Like we live in this society of such lowered expectations. And, <laughs> and if we ever do our. Lowered Transformers, expectations. Our Transformers movie commentary or whatever. That's the whole thing that's the point of that movie is that people seem to think that shit is good enough. And that's the thing I can't get my head around. It's like, you know what? You're a human being who works in some capacity for your money. And you think <laughs> so hard for that it, your honey. money, that, that you can be sold crap? You know, you don't have enough self-respect. And, and I just that movie Chronicle came out the other day and... That review that both of us saw of it said it was a movie. It wasn't great, but it actually had a story. Oh, yeah. And they're like, it's how sad. sad is it that that's all that a movie needs for me to say, wow, hey, that had a story. It told a story well. Uh, it's like that's all you need now for me to be pleased or surprised in a positive way. That's how much crap we have been force fed. We've been shoveled. I watched so. the Jack and Jill review that they did. <laughs> They're just going off. I didn't see it all the way through, actually. But they had their list. They're like, yeah. And so I thought maybe they might do this, judging from the trailer. No. They did nothing. <laughs> I thought they might do this. And that should be like, oh, I'm sorry. But no, they did nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Jason's Welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed oh, that oh, story. Oh, oh, oh. Keep what on trucking. Keep your ass what, grooving. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what determines if people like it? Now, is he talking about his fans? Is he talking about our listeners? You know what I mean? He says, if people like it, I'll keep doing it. Is he saying, if people like Ever Dreaming Verdict Plays, he will send us the next story? You I'm not I mean? sure. How, well, I'm who, sure. Who is he talking about? I'm sure he's just talking about everybody in general. If you all like it, I'll keep writing kind of a thing. Which would include our fans and his fans and Interzone magazine people as long as they keep buying it. this story originally appeared? I think so, yeah. I think both of them did. Okay. I mean, maybe this is content for the episode. Could be, if you want. That's what I would assume, but it's hard to say with a short story because... You can't like look at sales figures or right. something. We'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> or down or with it's on a podcast. You can't look at download figures and see, oh, did people like this one? It's hard to know at all because like movies where you talked about, we talked about that with our, that one time TV, you know, by ratings, whether people are, like it because they keep coming back. And if people don't keep coming back, then your show will go away. But with movies, once they got you in the door, they got your money and it doesn't matter if they... Well, it was like I was telling you today in the line, Devil Inside got an F cinema score. And that's when they ask people coming out of the movie, people who paid to see it, people who looked forward to seeing it enough to see it opening day, what kind of score they would give it, what kind of grade. And people gave it an F. And it was the only the first time, I mean, one of the first like five times in the last 10 years that it happened because... People who like horror movies go to these horror – people who don't like horror movies aren't going to go see Devil Inside opening right. day. And, that, and yet it got an F. But the studio doesn't give a crap about that because people went to see it. So yeah. it's like we're making a sequel to Devil Inside. Thank you very much. But, but it got an F. That means people didn't like it. Critics said it was horrible. People wished they hadn't gone to see it. And you're making a sequel. They're really making a sequel to that? They are. Well, and I I think that 
the main problem, the reason it got such a bad score is because it just, it just ends. Yeah. It has like a cliffhanger ending or a leave it up to you, what happens next ending, which I hate in a story. I hate it. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I, I hate it in, even in like books when you know. In yeah, like, you know, I know. There, we it's know like that story thing. ended just when I wanted it to begin. You know what? That's I bought the book. I am <laughs> keep my going. opinion is valid. You're like my wife, where she's just like, "Oh, I just love this story so much. I wish it could go on forever." And I said, "Oh, you should try reading Robert Jordan. That's that goes on forever." <laughs> not what I'm saying at all. I don't want it to go forever, but I want there to be an ending. And it's like we were saying in the other outtakes. We want a story well told that has a beginning, middle, and end. And is that too much to ask? Apparently, in the case of this movie, it was. Yeah. So let me finish with my point before we get back to the actual show. Okay. Short stories are the same kind of thing. They're like movies. Somebody's bought the magazine. You can't know. Do people like it? I don't know. How would you know? Like maybe they recommend it to their friends and more people buy it. But on top of that, magazine has 10 stories in it or something. So which story is it that they liked? See, that's hard. The How only, can you know? Only Although these days, I guess there's short stories on websites, so you can see who, right, how, but many how many hits stories, the page got or something. How many stories out there have like a five star and you can and the reader can give it however many stars they can? Yeah, I don't know. Like a YouTube video, that you can look at instantly and say, wow, look, this averages three and a half stars. This averages five stars, whatever it is. So and so many people have liked right. this. But I don't think in unless Interzone Magazine is way more ahead of the times than all the other online magazines, you're not going to have a score or an average reader gave this. Right. But although that has been useful to me on Amazon.com, you go over there yeah. and there's a bunch of books on Billy Wilder or something like that. And it's like, which book do I want to read? And it's like, well, users gave this number of stars. And it's like, OK, well, that's the one I'm going to tackle. Who the hell writes a Amazon review about cop dog anyways? Oh, do the voice of the woman. <laughs> Motherfuckers. <laughs> I rented cop dog for my child because I thought that little boy with no arms her, and legs would enjoy what? You're doing it to Brooklyn. Well, I don't she was Minas- she, she was a Minnesotan. Oh. <laughs> It's not an election year, but people are acting like it is. I think every year is an election year in one way or another. I wish every year were an erection year for you, sir. But sadly, those days are over. The blood AI. Oh, Brian Lincoln. Wait, purple AI. Oh, that was the At other. The end, there's pink AI. I'm sure it's coming. The gay AI. The gay eye. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't funny, man. I got a gay eye before a cataract was removed. Well, maybe they call it a queer eye then. Oh, see what he did there? My nephew was watching uh, Fudge, uh, Panda, Kung Fu Panda Kung Fu series Panda? today. Oh. And the villain of the week was voiced by Wallace Shawn. Oh, yeah. And he do- did the same voice that he does for everything. Uh-huh. He, he doesn't switch it up. He's just always Wallace that's Shawn. That's kind of his voice. And I was trying to convince him that that was Rex. I was like, oh my God, that's, that's, listen, listen, that's Rex from Toy Story. And he's like, no, that's a pig. And I'm like, no, I, I, he, I, okay, but don't look, close your eyes, listen to the voice, that's Rex. And he just, it, it was above his head. He didn't understand. Yeah. My wife tried to do that. She was watching the new sitcom that Tim Allen is in. And mm. she's like, do you guys recognize that guy's voice? And they're like, no. Last man. And they're like, okay, okay, close your close your eyes. Now, who who are you listening to? And she's like, eh, I don't know. Is it El DeBarge? No, that's not what I mean. Yeah. So uh, how old does a kid get before they – I remember being a little boy you and start seeing recognizing them. this black dude – on some PBS thing and them saying that that was Darth Vader. And I was just like, whoa, what? But I've seen him with the helmet off, you know? It's just... <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. You know what I think would be fun is just to take like a whole bunch of lines that are from various movies that James Earl Jones has been in and then Vaderize them, you know, make them put in the breathing and put in like the, the rottiness to it and just like do some kind of a parody where he's just saying... People have done that. I guess he did a couple of black exploitation flicks in, right. the, in the the seventies, where he's like, you know, chill out, motherfucker, and that, and, and you hear, 
<laughs> and stuff. And they, they, cause his mouth doesn't ever move as right, Vader. Yeah, you don't see and it. so you just splice that in and it looks like it's part of the movie. And, uh, I'm sure there's just tons of it on YouTube. So. Oh, that would be fun to watch. We should spend the next few hours doing that instead of recording uh, anything else. Yet we shan't. Oh, yes, we shall. Um, okay, so I guess uh, the voice stuff, the, the Rex is all outtakes. No, it doesn't have to be. It's up to you. Whatever works and doesn't work. The It's an invitation across the nation. A, a celebration, so spread the word? No, That's that... right. It doesn't matter what you wear just as long as you are there plague bird singing in the de- oh no what has happened sir is this it frozen is page preview i now see our dune steve page in the stupid timeline version which oh I, that, which i hate when did that happen mine doesn't do that uh, it's the preview it said Pages will all change to this soon. Oh, no. Preview now. And so I previewed it, and now it shows that to me every time. The, there's no option to go back to the old way. It's just publish now or, yeah, there's start tour, publish now. Dang, that sucks. Don't you love how they have to, I mean, Facebook is, I, I'll bet there's a, a quarter of a billion people on Facebook. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And the, to mess with it now. It's like, oh, it's not good enough. It's not. It, we need to continue to change things. I guess that's what's his face it. for you. According to the movie that I saw, that's the way he is. But yeah, why? Because you got to keep messing with it. And eventually you're just like, oh, yeah, that's the way it always was. But I hate the timeline thing. I hate it. It's just I can't find anything on it. And I assume it's still there somewhere, but I can't find it. I hate it. Well, it's like the resets at a grocery store or a Walmart or whatever, and and things that used to be in a certain place are now in a different place. How does that help the people? How does that help an elderly woman that comes to Walmart (laughs) every other Sunday or something like that? And she's got nine things that she gets, and it takes her an hour instead of the half hour it normally takes her. Yeah. Oh, save that up just for you. Gross. Welcome to the show.